Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second series of our HCD webinar series, Humpy Center for Design. Today, we are lucky to have architect Takti Fatima, who is exploring another genre of work uh, in our journey. So, we're looking forward to hearing more about what Takti is doing. And uh, the title of her topic is uh, No End in Sight Design Adventures in Embracing Uncertainty. And we really want to get into a journey of uh, exploring that adventure, design adventure. Takbir is an architect, educator, and entrepreneur. She is the director of the Interdisciplinary Experimental Design and Architecture Studio, Design Aware. Takbir also started the Fractals Workshop and Build Aware. She has an MRC in architecture preservatism from the Design Research Lab and the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. She is also a fellow of the Startup Leadership Program. Takbir was named a Telangana Eng Architect by the Indian Institute of Architects. And we are really, really, really looking forward to her, her uh, design adventures in embracing uncertainty. And uh, I would like to hand it over to architect Takbir Fatima uh, on that journey. Over to you, Takbir. Welcome on to this. Uh, Thank you. Webinar. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, uh, architect Chetan, and also uh, Humpy Center for Design. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to uh, share my work um, on this platform. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and share my presentation. So, um, uh, as Sir introduced, uh, I uh, I'm an architect, uh, an educator, and I also uh, I have an MR from uh, in the Design Research Lab uh, from the Architectural Association in London. Uh, prior to that, I did my bachelor's in architecture in uh, in uh, Sikandarabad, CSIIT Sikandarabad, and um, I've kind of uh, been living and working in many different uh, cities and countries. Uh, since since I was born, I guess, and um, so uh, since childhood, I was in Saudi Arabia, then I moved to India uh, and the UK, and I've been working uh, now between India and Dubai. So this is our studio, uh, Design Aware. Um, as mentioned, it's an experimental architecture and interdisciplinary design uh, studio, which deals with projects of all uh, different scales and different uh, typologies. <clears throat> and the thing that kind of runs through uh, the theme that runs through is experimentation. So this is our Hatabad studio. We have another one in Dubai. Uh, this is generally how our studio looks. We have been visited by uh, schools of architecture, uh, groups of architects and students from all over India um, in the last five or six years of our existence. But unfortunately, this is how our studio looked just until a couple of months ago, because um, Keeping aside, you know, the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, Hyderabad was also hit with um, really severe floods. So our entire studio got flooded up to two feet in height, and you can see the disaster that this is. This car just got flipped right in front of our studio. So um, we are kind of dealing not just this year or or the last year. Um, we were dealing not just with um, the pandemic, the lockdown, and everything associated with it, but also on top of that, another layer was the flood, which caused a lot of uh, damage and a lot of uh, rethinking that we had to do. And one after the other, things kept happening, and it seemed like there was no end in sight. And that's why my talk is entitled No End in Sight, Design Adventures in Embracing Uncertainty. Um, the other reason why I've cho chose, uh, chosen to call it No End in Sight is because um, all of the designs that we start with, we don't really think about where we're going to be headed, and we don't know what the end is going to be. Uh, we uh, so th this is something that I like to say over and over. Only when you become comfortable with uncertain with uncertainty can you innovate and evolve. And um, this quote by Martin Luther King Jr. really um, inspires me and really speaks to me. He says, uh, "Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step." So that's what we've been doing all along. We've been taking the first step without really knowing where we're going, uh, without knowing what the outcome is going to be. And I think this would, if some of our clients were listening to this, they would get really freaked out if they get, got to know that we don't know what we're doing. <clears throat> so we start with a lot of different questions. Uh, we 
we may or may not have answers to these questions, but we like to ask questions and then get on this kind of journey or search towards the answers. So um, I'm gonna just um, show you six of these questions and where they took us. Um, so the first question, I think we can't really ignore the uh, elephant in, room, in the room, which is catastrophe. What is the role of an architect in response to catastrophe? The kind of catastrophes that we've seen in the year 2020. So as soon as uh, the lockdown hit, we kind of uh, began to um, you know, look at these, at these stories. Of course, initially we were uh, concerned with our own issues, but then we started to look at what was happening around the country with uh, migrant workers and uh, daily wage workers, uh, construction workers who are the backbone of the construction industry. They were suffering uh, through the lockdown without any work. So we started to, um, we had already started to kind of head um, online and um, organize this lecture series called The Road Less Traveled. And then we began to, you know, we decided that we will monetize this lecture series and we'll, we'll uh, raise funds in order to hashtag starve the hunger virus uh, and raise all, this, all these uh, funds and channelize them towards uh, the plight of the migrant workers and maybe some um, also donations towards um, uh, the, pan the COVID research as well. So this, the entire premise of this, um, Road Less Travel lecture series was to bring together many different architects from different walks of life who are now uh, not practicing mainstream architecture, but they're doing, they've taken a divergent kind of path. So initially, you know, uh, whenever we're um, starting to uh, sort of, when we start uh, architecture school, we're told that there's only one way to be an architect. That is that you, you, you're a solo practitioner or you're heading a firm, you design buildings and you, and they get built and you're an architect. That's what an architect is. But that could not be farther from the truth because there are many, many different ways to be an architect. And this lecture series called Road Less Travel explores, um, the journeys of nine different architects from different parts of the world. And they all headed towards different journeys. Um, and then we raised funds, we, we ticketed the event, we raised funds to um, help volunteer organizations um, uh, help and support the migrant workers. Okay. So um, as, as the video uh, showed you, uh, we were able to raise quite a bit of funds uh, within just three weeks, and we were able to channelize these funds into, into these causes that, that were mentioned. Uh, so with this, we kind of began to head into something called the virtual studio, where we, um, you know, we carried on all our work in the virtual realm. Um, and um, it was really interesting uh, that a lot of people became more and more open to working online and uh, we were able to work in so many different cities, um, you know, uh, virtually and remotely, which we hadn't done before. So we, uh, before we were limited to working, um, you know, if we physically uh, had some connection or we were able to travel to these different places around the world, but um, now we're able to work uh, in collaboration with uh, places or, or organizations all over the world and reach, uh, reach out to students as well. So that uh, brings us to the next question. How can independent discrete agents work towards a common goal? So I teach this workshop called the Fractals Workshop, which is a generative design um, and uh, 3D thinking uh, sort of form finding workshop. Uh, over the last um, eight years, um, until 2019, it had been to 13 different cities. Uh, we had worked with 14 materials. We had done 24 workshop series. Uh, and reached 1,500 participants. And in um, the lockdown and, and beyond that, so in 2020, uh, we reached out to many more cities um, than before. 
and we uh, were able to reach out to participants from all over the world. So we had participants from the world over coming together and working together towards a common goal. So the premise of the workshop is that many minds and many ha hands come together to create something that is much bigger or much greater, um, a whole or a result that is much greater than the sum of its parts. <clears throat> the Fractals workshop has also been featured on the on the cover of Surfaces Reporter magazine. Uh, this is the student work of one of the workshops. So the workshop is a really tactile, hands-on workshop in which um, students use material, uh, disposable material. Uh, for example, in this, they're using disposable uh, plastic straws um, and, and create geometric forms that are repetitive. And they write their own sort of analog algorithms that um, create these forms. So they're inspired by nature, and then they create these uh, forms based on on these uh, rule systems that they write themselves or algorithms. So the, the workshop is really analog in its nature and we end the workshop usually with this huge physical exhibition of the work. Uh, the previous one was in Velour, this one uh, was in Sharjah using paper cups, disposable paper cups. Uh, sometimes uh, we use natural material and then some of these have got manifested into installations such as this installation for the by design week. Um, you can uh, you can see the context there that's the Burj Khalifa in the background so we were able to um, design and build this hyperbolic paraboloid called the Weavex uh, using palm frond um, mid ribs uh, which is locally called Arish so that's the, the local natural material uh, in the UAE and this is on permanent um, installation uh, in Dubai in Dubai design district and the same installation was uh, replicated uh, during the Hyderabad design week last year in 2019 in, in October. Uh, and then a whole series of different installations that came from um, workshops. So I'm going to just talk about this one installation where actually for Hyderabad Design Week, the government of Telangana had commissioned us to design uh, and design and build a series of installations for the city for that um, Design Week, uh, which was also coinciding with the 31st World Design Assembly which was to be held in Hyderabad. So what we decided was <clears throat> instead of design aware, instead of architects designing and building uh, certain uh, you know, installations, why don't we hand this over to the students? And why don't we uh, you know, put the spotlight on the students and get the students to design, to work together and design and build uh, collaboratively. And then um, this would actually create something meaningful for the city. So they would have uh, the sense of ownership for the city and also be able to make their mark uh, at a very young age. And another thing I want to um, kind of insert here is that um, I always think back at what I would have liked for, you know, to do or I would have liked for it to happen when I was a student. The opportunities that were not there, I like to create those those opportunities for students of today. Um, so I just like to put myself into um, their shoes from when I was a student and then uh, imagine what would have been uh, amazing for me. And I like to, because I have the um, authority to do so now or the or the resources to do so, I'm able to create those opportunities. So that was the whole aim, to put the spotlight on the students and let them create something for the city rather than uh, us architects creating something which we would be able to do any other time as well. So this is one of the designs that was selected. We did a whole series of different workshops uh, called Collective Intelligence uh, across the city of Hyderabad. So different uh, colleges of architecture and design. Um, and this was one of the uh, designs that was selected. And then it was completely designed by the students. And then they built it uh, or fabricated it in collaboration with the uh, fabricators and the welders. So they, uh, the students were able to guide the, the fabricators and learn from them as well. And then they uh, got the entire installation installed. Um, and this is made in metal. <clears throat> this is now permanently located uh, opposite the Telangana State Assembly uh, in Hyderabad. We call this the peacock because it kind of reminds us of the peacock. This is a statue of uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. This is last winter. So when, um, you know, as you can see, everything is really uh, tactile and analog and tangible, uh, and it occupies, um, you know, urban space. So how do you translate a workshop that is so analog, that is so dependent on material uh, into the virtual realm? So that was our challenge throughout the year. So, um, and, and it's really interesting that we were able to kind of translate, transfer this workshop online 
Uh, and instead of students who are in the same physical space, we had students who were um, to totally apart, but they were together virtually and they collaborated um, in, in groups virtually with people that they never met before, people from different parts of the world. Uh, and then um, we also were able to kind of learn and explore different uh, ways of um, teaching, ways of learning, ways of making. Um, and so uh, these are some of the ways that we were, um, you know, able to guide them. Uh, some of the installations that came up or some of the designs that came up, they're, they're not installations yet. They're just open ended design explorations. And then later we decided to translate them because we're always uh, at the end of every um, workshop, we have an exhibition of the work. So we decided to translate them into um, virtual exhibitions, which are virtual reality uh, platforms, um, and then give them a set, sort of sense of scale and material. Uh, so this is the latest workshop that we did. So, so we collaborated with many different um, you know, organizations during this time. Uh, we collaborated with Facebook, uh, with um, Turinscape Academy in China, and the Boston Architectural College in the USA. And this last uh, one, which I would really like you to, um, you know, like to invite you to see this exhibition, which is still open. This is uh, in the virtual realm. Uh, this is the latest workshop that we did. And this is all student work. It's completely scaleless and uh, you could say it's useless, but um, it's, it's a design, it's a series of design explorations based on analog algorithms that the students wrote themselves. <clears throat> so from that, uh, that brings us to the question, how can creativity take birth from constraints? So we saw that the constraint of not being in the physical space, we were able to um, sort of respond to that in this way uh, with these with this virtual reality workshops. But also when it comes to architecture, how does creativity take birth from constraints? Uh, I'd like to share a project with you, uh, an architectural project, so really switching tracks um, from kind of digital stuff to uh, something that is real and, um, and tangible. So this is uh, in, located in Hyderabad. This is KBR National Park in Jubilee Hills in Hyderabad. Um, and you can see the, the site. So Hyderabad has a very hilly, rocky kind of terrain. Uh, and so you have many um, areas of Hyderabad which are called hills. So you have uh, Jubilee Hills. This is the, the location. Uh, and the orange um, parallelogram there is our site. Our site is literally in the shape of a parallelogram, which is a really odd shape uh, to work with. Um, but this is what we what we had. And so uh, because of Vastu constraints, uh, we would have really loved to make uh, you know uh, a building that was shaped like a parallelogram. Uh, but because of Vastu, constraints, we were uh, limited to something like, um, you know, we, we had to work with orthogonal um, sort of 90 degree angles only. So these were some some explorations trying to figure out how we could, you know, make the most of this site, which is um, oddly shaped. And then yet we would have to kind of cut off triangles on either end. Suppose we were to make a, a rectangular building, then we would have to lose these triangles. And, and the requirements of the brief were quite heavily loaded. So the requirements were really uh, intense and we had to, in order to fulfill the requirements, we had to increase the, the floor area as much as possible. These are some of the massing studies as well to, to understand um, whether we could create a stepped uh, sort of massing uh, and how many steps would be, would be required for that. I like to work with a lot of uh, found objects. So any objects that are, you know, just lying around that, that could already be, you've seen um, paper paper cups and plastic straws earlier in the workshop. So these are uh, staples and then just stacking the staples to see how the massing would come out. Finally, this is how the design evolved. We sort of tapered the building and then we started to slice it so that we have the orthogonal kind of facade. And then you can see that every level has different steps. So it has, um, you know, a, a series of steps at every um, every uh, at a different level, um, every floor, but also within each level, there are three steps. So uh, the entire uh, building is divided into three three parts or nine parts, and this is how um, it looks, the, the massing of it. So you have um, a kind of uh, stepped or pixelated um, geometry to it, where uh, every, um, you know, uh, every floor is kind of cantilevered by three feet. And then uh, you have steps of three feet as well on every, uh, within the floor plate. 
So this is the design that we proposed. We call this crescendo uh, because it, it reminds us of notes of music, especially um, Fifth Symphony of Beethoven that goes da 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 dum. So it kind of reminds us of that uh, feeling, the way the, the building is kind of growing uh, in, in terms of scale um, or musical skills, I mean. So this is, you can see in the, um, in the section, you can see that there's three feet of cantilever on every level. And we like to work with many different scales. So our sketches might be limited to the um, to the notebook or the sketchbook, but also really large scale on the uh, on the wall because we also have interior design. So we were doing architecture as well as interior design. So we had to blow up the the plans and make them much bigger and then detail them out. So this is how the plan sort of develops from one floor to the next, and you can see that the floor area is increasing as you go up upwards. So every um, upper level has a bigger floor area than the one below it. <clears throat> and then the facade itself. Um, so we designed the facade uh, in response to the program or the spaces within um, that, the building. So wherever we had a dressing room, we wanted to have lesser number of openings or lesser pretend percentage of openings. Where there were green and open spaces, obviously we wanted to have really big uh, openings or larger percentage of openings and larger uh, amount of light coming in. And then uh, for bedrooms, we, we needed privacy. So we uh, wanted to have a smaller percentage of openings. So this is how uh, parametrically the, um, the facade developed. So it's a series of rotating louvers that, are, that rotate in uh, different angles and they create different openings um, to let in light and also uh, for privacy. So uh, some of these are also openable and closable. So they're not, they're uh, dynamic. So you can actually close uh, some of the louvers, which are uh, towards the bedroom. You can just close it up and it acts like uh, one layer of a curtain. So that's the facade with the massing. And we wanted to give it a kind of wooden finish because this was starting to look really tall and imposing like a commercial building. So in order to give it that residential, um, you know, home-like feel, we went for wood. So that's the visualization of that. And then from the inside, so this is the top floor with the pool. Uh, so the upper floor is a kind of semi-open space, uh, which has a party hall and a pool, kind of an entertainment zone. Uh, so this is how it looks from here. So you would be able to see this amazing view of the city below, uh, because this is at a height. And uh, in the bedrooms, you can see that the louvers kind of uh, have different turning um, angles. So they filter in the light. And then you can do away with one layer of curtains because of that, because that acts as a curtain. And then the green space is kind of an open space. And uh, what's really interesting is that we didn't completely close uh, the part where the uh, dressing room is coming up. We allowed um, some of the louvers to sort of stay open there uh, because you would have this really nice filtration of light. Suppose you had, you know, your entire closet is filled with clothes. When you open the closet uh, and then took out some of the clothes, you would you would get um, light coming in, which we found really to be interesting. Uh, the same motif of that um, uh, of the turning or twisting louvers uh, sort of repeats itself in different places within the interior. So you have that um, same motif coming up in the uh, on the door uh, design. And then you have that, if you can see on the right side, that's the meditation room. So the meditation room as well has the same kind of uh, design to it. And the entire project is Vastu compliant. So um, we also started to get into uh, not just design, but also construction. Um, in particular, uh, project management or construction administration management uh, and site supervision. Um, I mean, who would be crazy enough to start a new business during the pandemic? Well, that's us. We're, we're the crazy ones. So we started something called BuildAware, uh, where, you know, being a control freak, um, I would really like greater control over the way things are constructed rather than uh, just the design. So usually when we design something, it doesn't get built the way we want it to. So in order to gain better, better control over the quality um, of the, out, you know, the, the final uh, product that we're delivering to the client, um, we started something called Build-Aware. 
uh, we at the same time we started uh, an initiative called Studio to Site. Like I said earlier, um, I'm always thinking about what are the things that I missed out when I was a student or a young architect. Um, you know, just just starting out in my career. Uh, one thing I really missed out on was site visits. Um, I think we hardly went um, to a live construction site when when we were in college. Uh, even if we did, we didn't understand the entire process. We never went to a construction site regularly to see the process of construction happening on site. So um, that was the entire premise or the idea behind Studio to Site um, to teach young architects um, how uh, design evolves and how it gets translated from drawings to uh, to actually, you know, built, uh, built or constructed buildings. So um, we invited uh, applications from many different students and young architects, and they all joined us for this uh, uh, sort of um, uh, initiative or a program called Studio to Site. Uh, obviously, they would have to be locally available in Hyderabad. So we had different sites. We have three different sites that are going on in Hyderabad, and then uh, we would take them to different sites um, every week. Unfortunately, before that, the lockdown happened, so we had to sort of put that on hold. Um, this is uh, coming back to crescendo, the, the house. This is under construction. This is the current state, actually, after the lockdown has been lifted and construction activity has been resumed. So while the lockdown happened, we had to move all our, you know, all our work online and even teaching studio to site, we had to sort of do it online. So we started to teach project management and ways of um, learning about project management, which is something that is not taught outside of the elective of pro project management. But I feel that every every architect and designer should know this. Um, and then when the sites reopened, we kind of went back on site with the precautions and the and the safety measures. And then we started uh, to hold these classes again. The next question, uh, again, switching tracks to something really different, is how can data drive design? So this is a project which um, it didn't get built. It's a conceptual uh, design. We were required to uh, design a kind of installation uh, for uh, the World Government Summit in 2019 that was uh, that was held in Dubai. So uh, we were commissioned by the Museum of the Future uh, in Dubai to design uh, an installation that was futuristic and kind of represents uh, their values. So what we did was we analyzed their website and we kind of um, understood what are the, you know, how many clicks are there? What are the different, what is the uh, click map or, uh, of the site? So how does a user interact with the site? Um, what, what is the age group of the users? What's the duration of the stay? And over a period of six months, uh, we got the data and we sort of translated that into this kind of three-dimensional graphical representation. So it's a 3D graph um, and it's, it's based on vectors. So all the different colors you see are different um, age groups. And then um, this is what, how it manifested itself. Curves are the, the site uh, or the, or the uh, click map. And then the lines are you know, different durations over the year. These are different views of this, this installation. This is what we proposed. This was the entrance to the exhibition. And then... Um, it looks different from different angles. Uh, another way that we analyzed data was uh, we were asked to design a kind of business center, which is which is basically a kiosk uh, for Rajiv Gandhi International Airport in Hyderabad, and we had to design this kiosk for um, like uh, where people could make a phone call or or print something or browse the internet. Um, so the way that we got inspired was uh, by understanding the trajectories or the the flight paths. Of different flights uh, and then the takeoff and, and landing uh, angles of flights and we translated that into this um, space that was uh, a kind of semi-open space uh, and the entire space looks really transparent and um, uh, kind of lightweight and almost invisible so it's kind of like an ex exoskeleton rather than um, uh, an actual structure. So when you see it from afar, it's completely transparent. But the material that we proposed for this was fiberglass. So fiberglass has this fiber optic quality to it where if you light one of the edges, all of the edges get lit. So um, we used LED lights and then you light um, some of the edges in blue and then 
all of the edges kind of get lit and you see those flight paths. So that was the, the proposal which also didn't get built. Uh, what makes a space intelligent? So this is another project, another uh, still conceptual project. It's on hold right now. So this we were um, asked to design an office for um, for an IoT and IT firm that was uh, had its different offices in Hyderabad, uh, the USA, and Mexico. So they they wanted a space which would be kind of uh, dynamic and which would have uh, sort of um, this character to it where it was a smart space uh, and a kind of living, breathing sort of space. Um, because this is an IoT company, they had many different products uh, such as you know home automation products, um, sensors, and so many different things which would um, sort of read the environment and give back some sort of feedback. So uh, this was the site that was given to us. This is almost like um, architecture come interior design project in which this was to be like a penthouse. So this is the uh, an existing building of five floors. And on the sixth or the or the roof, we had to design this sort of penthouse. Uh, and we designed it in two levels. Um, <clears throat> and we took inspiration from the, the honeycomb kind of structure to uh, come up with the, with the um, envelope of the building. So you can see on the left side, you can see the facade. The facade uh, is a simple kind of honeycomb structure, but it also has um, something embedded in it in terms of um, program because uh, it ha it varies in depth uh, depending on the requirement and depending on how much of you know um, shading is required in that area. So that independent the facade and the envelope of the building is completely independent for from the rest of the building. And you have these sort of beehive um, pods here, which I'll be talking about a little later. So the, the ceiling or, or the roof um, is a kind of a corrugated shaped uh, roof, which is undulating. Um, and then uh, at different, you know, uh, it's alternatively uh, facing different ways. Um, it's almost like an extrusion of the, the honeycomb structure and that's how it's evolved. Um, and the entire structure was supposed to be uh, made in steel. These are some of the, um, you know, sort of um, daylighting analysis that we did uh, because this was supposed to be on the top of the um, of the existing building. It would be kind of hot. So what we did here was, um, as you've seen in the in the floor plan, we um, designed this entire space around a courtyard, even though it's on the sixth floor of the you know um, of the building we designed it around a courtyard so that it has this feeling of being grounded um, and also uh, the traditional sort of indian elements um, or vernacular element of a courtyard uh, with a green space which really refreshes you while you're working that that would be fulfilled um, and the uh, the honeycomb facade sort of uh, reminds us of, of um, screens in traditional buildings um, or jalis uh, and um, these are the pods that are stack, stacked one on top of the other. So these are kind of like isolation pods, um, which uh, I've just, this is actually not a 2020 project, but I've uh, updated it uh, with face masks because this actually does work in the current uh, scenario of social distancing. So you have certain pods which are, um, which are sort of isolation pods where you can uh, sit alone. There are different ways of working that people like to adapt. So uh, you could have, uh, distancing or you could have isolation um, and then uh, flexibility is really important uh, flexibility of all kinds of spaces so this is one space which is which turns from an informal kind of hangout uh, area or a lunch eating area to something that is more formal for a presentation um, so the arena seating sort of uh, allows for that um, and then this uh, big box that you see in the center. This is actually the water tank that was existing on site and that could not be relocated. So uh, we treated the water tank. So so the water tank was at a certain height um, and below that we kept the toilets and then we um, enveloped the entire thing uh, into a smart, we created a smart wall. So it's almost like um, a smart wall which uh, which can display many different things. So it can display, you know, um, all the, uh, you can have a, um, company-wide meeting with people from different locations uh, of the same company, or you could have, um, you know, you could have, uh, you could track the number of 
the the amount of water that was used in different flushes throughout the day or in in the toilet or you could use use it to display uh, what the weather is like outside and um, we also embedded certain smart elements into the building so that the glasses or the the glass gets tinted when it's sunny out and then it gets um, you know less frosted when it's raining out uh, in response to the weather so the building becomes uh, almost like a smart living breathing building what was really interesting and unplanned in this was that um, this is something that we did not uh, even think about. So usually when you have a building uh, or, or something like a penthouse, which is on top of a building, which is very tall, uh, you only get to see maybe from the road or the street level, you get to see um, its facade or it's um, just the ceiling part of it. Uh, you do not get to look inside the building head on. But this um, was really interesting that the metro came up right when we were you know in the middle of the design process and the metro line uh in Hyderabad was passing right by this building because this is at a very prime kind of uh, commercial location uh in jubilee hills in Hyderabad. um so the metro is passing right in front of this and you're from the metro you would be able to look right into the building and see um you know see what's going on in the building so that was a kind of serendipitous happy discovery that happened during our design process and finally, the question, why does nature, where does nature end and the built environment begin? This is, uh, I think, one of our most favorite projects. Uh, this is a charity school uh, located in Golconda in Hyderabad. So <clears throat> this is the Golconda Fort, um, which is uh, more than 800 years old. It was uh, built by the Kakatiyas and, um, and then subsequently it was taken over by, by many of the different dynasties and then it was added to um, and so the fort itself is made of granite uh, which is very abundantly found in Hyderabad the entire uh, area is really rocky and very uh, you know it's, it consists of a lot of stone quarries so the entire fort is made of stone and then in in the foreground you can see uh, you know the rock so th these are not boulders but this is sheet rock it's part of the mountain so the fort sits on top of the mountain and you can see and the, and the rock formations are more than 250 million years old so in this one image you can see our built and our natural heritage so this is the um the satellite view of the fort you can see the fort wall here i hope you can see my pointer you can see the wall going around here and then you see this really dense uh, settlement within the fort walls. So the entire uh, city before before Hyderabad, the entire city was confined to Golconda within the fort walls. And so that settlement, uh, more than 800 years old, is still in existence uh, even today. So that settlement um, is really low-rise, high-density courtyard houses, which are which all have shared walls. Um, and then on the left side, uh, you can see that it's it's completely open and unbuilt. Um, and the reason uh, on the lower left side why it's unbuilt is because it's really, really steep. So the terrain is um, practically unbuildable. The slopes are too steep for uh, construction. And the rest of the houses are also not on flat land. These are all on the mountain. So the houses are nestled uh, within the mountains. And this is our site. So almost towards the higher part of the mountain, that's where the site was. And we were commissioned to design a charity school for children from disadvantaged backgrounds who were living in and around uh, the Golconda Fort area. So we are actually, um, our site is actually within the outer walls of the Golconda Fort. <clears throat> and I, I think it's a once in a lifetime kind of project where you would get uh, a site which is inside a fort. So this is uh, how it looks from above. Um, illegal uh, aerial view using drone uh, photography. So this, um, you can see that this is how the, the school nestles itself into this really dense settlement. And then you can sort of make out that this part is really, on the left side, is really uh, steep. This is the context. So uh, really narrow winding uh, lanes with you know um, houses with shared walls, really narrow houses with courtyards in between. So you don't have setbacks. You have shared walls and then you have this really peculiar character where these are all obviously self-designed self-built homes uh, with really brightly colored walls which is kind of typical to almost all indian cities right and because it's a mountain you have a lot of goats everywhere so this is how um 
the uh, the site was. So we just went back in time on Google Earth and uh, Google Maps, and then we sort of got this uh, view of it before we started to to the construct to the design and construction. So on the site there was an existing mosque, uh, which was designed and built by um, by the client herself. Uh, and um, and supposedly there was a, a sort of heritage structure uh, that was lying in ruins here, and then she just re rejuvenated that. On the left side, there is this uh, thing called the existing school, which was just a large hall with partitions in it. Uh, so it was just um, a very informal sort of school that was running in there. Um, everything in orange that you see is on a higher level, and everything in white is on a lower level. So the site itself was naturally divided into two parts where you have the zero level and then you have this level which is at uh, six and a half meters above the lower level uh, almost 20 feet or two floors of difference uh, in height so the the site itself is divided into two parts and the site was also acquired incrementally so um, the upper part of the site was acquired first and then later they acquired this parcel of land and then they acquired a courtyard house which they um, demolished. So everything that is in dotted lines was demolished. So there was this existing retaining wall dividing the two parts of the site, and that became one by demolition, or um, I'll, I'll tell you later how that happened. Uh, and then you have the uh, existing courtyard house, which kind of became uh, a sort of secondary entrance to the school. Uh, and what's really interesting is there, there was a playground or an open area in the school, which is really rare. This is the, the terrain. That's me on site. Uh, that's on the right side is the newly uh, uh, demolished existing courtyard house um, at that point of time. On the left side is the existing retaining wall. And you can see on the left side, you, you begin to see the cliff. It's a cliff, a wall of rock that is dividing both the sides. And these, as I said earlier, these are not loose boulders, which can just be uh, kind of, you know, moved with a crane. Uh, or, or broken and taken apart, but these they, these actually form part of the mountain. This is sheet rock, which forms part of the mountain. Uh, one of our aims was to preserve this rock, uh, not only because um, the only way that you could cut the rock is to blast it, um, and that would cause considerable damage to the neighborhood around. And also, it would not be uh, we would not get permissions for that because um, it's part of a heritage zone. So that was anyway not one of our options at all because we wanted to preserve uh, the ecology of the site. Um, so we began with that principle. So as I said earlier, the upper part uh, was kind of uh, flat because it's uh, filled. There was this retaining wall which is filled with soil. So it almost forms like a box of soil. And then you had this open playground there. On the left side, you see part of the existing school or just a large you know, large shed kind of uh, building. You see uh, the Golconda Fort in the background, uh, Lanko Hills and uh, Qutub Shahi Tombs uh, mausoleum complex. Wherever you turn on the site, no matter where you're standing, if you turn around, you will see the Golconda Fort around you because you're inside the fort. So again, this is facing the other way. You have the mosque, you have the Golconda Fort in the background, the existing old schoolhouse in the, in the foreground, and then we're standing on the Playground. So it's just a diagram to show how the how the site was. You have this um, box of soil with this existing courtyard, uh, sorry, existing retaining wall, which was filled up to create this playground that was existing already. Then um, these courtyard houses, and then another courtyard house which was demolished and made part of the site. This is the way um, school looked from the inside of the existing school. Just a large shed with different partitions. Quite uh, depressing, um, to say the least. It's a very dark, sort of um, uh, uninspiring atmosphere. This is not at all how any school should be, but unfortunately, this is increasingly how charity schools are. On the other hand, if you look at the outside, so the right side is the same building which we were inside just, just now. On the other, uh, on the outside, on the other side of the wall uh, of the door, you have this amazing, beautiful uh, tree, which is green, and and you have really bright, uh, nice spaces. The children are used to studying under the trees, which is our traditional, you know, uh, way of studying. And so this, the children were really kind of used to the rugged uh, nature of the site. This is very peculiar because they are living in a metropolitan city, 
but at the same time they are really uh, used to the terrain and the ruggedness and the mountains and they're they are very much um, you know comfortable with climbing these mountains because their houses themselves are nestled into these mountains uh, so we had to do extensive um, site analysis to really understand the site multiple multiple uh, land surveys um, and, and geological surveys to understand the site uh, and also multiple massing models and actually the site itself dictated the design completely so the site uh, the, the, the building sort of grows from the site so the, the shape of this of the building is dictated by the site itself so you have this one entrance at the lower level uh, where the courtyard house used to be and then you have this road that you climb up all around and then you can enter from the upper level as well which is two floors above this <clears throat> and you have the playground so actually um it would have been really easy just to propose the design on the playground because that's the flattest part of the site uh, but um apart from preserving the rock and the existing trees um we also wanted to preserve this playground because it's very rare to have a playground uh, or an open kind of lung space in the heart of this dense uh, city. Uh, even, uh, you know, private schools sometimes don't have uh, playgrounds nowadays. Uh, so urban schools. So this is this was a big asset, which we really didn't want to do away with um, or occupy. So we kept the playground and then we decided to build on the most difficult part of the site. Uh, and we got cursed by a lot of engineers for that. So this is the playground in the center and then you have everything around it so as i said on the lower level you have this uh entrance from the what used to be a courtyard a uh, narrow kind of space and then you have this um a pathway that goes around and then you can enter uh from the upper level which is at six and a half meters or <coughs> two floors above uh and then so you have two kind of journeys that you can take. You can either enter the, the building directly or you can enter from the playground. So instead of um, a regular building where you enter uh, at the street level and go up, you could also enter at the top and go down. So that's really interesting in this school. So uh, we call these different levels, we call them lower ground, middle ground and upper ground because each of these floors touches the ground or touches the part of the cliff or the rock at different points. So you have the lower ground, the, which is the plan kind of shrinks and grows depending on where the rock is. So we had to do a lot of um, design and redesign during the construction process because every time we excavated, we hit the rock. So here you can see that the, the what we designed earlier was a typical floor plan with classrooms on either side and you have the, um, you have the, the common uh, circulation zone in the center. But we had to change that because uh, every time they started excavating, we we hit rock, and so we had to uh, we lost two classrooms on the lower level. We had to make up for those two classrooms on the upper level. So what we did was um, this uh, the middle ground that you see uh, floating in the middle here. That's the one that has two extra classrooms. Um, and how we got these two classrooms was by digging uh, into the the filled part of the of the retaining wall. So the the retaining wall, we knew that it was a box of soil. We knew that um, it was definitely not naturally flat. There must be some you know soil that was filled in it, and then it that could be excavated again. But because the retaining wall was so sound, um, you know, it was already existing. The client was completely in opposition to demolishing the corner of the retaining wall and trying to dig for more space there. Uh, but then, you know, uh, God was on our side because that monsoon was so heavy that it brought down the retaining wall by itself. And then we got space for two more classrooms, um, you know, naturally. Uh, so this is a sectional sketch. So you, you're able to see that the, the lower ground, the middle ground, the upper ground, they all touch the, the, um, the soil or the, or the earth at, that, at different points. We took inspiration from the color palette of the surrounding um you know the kitschy neighborhood all the colors of the bright colors of the neighborhood and we decided that we would use primary colors uh and green and in pops of uh, and orange and pops of color throughout the school so this is the this is a model of the finished uh, uh or design so we used uh colors only in the doors the windows um the staircases the skylight the grills and the gates 
these are the places where we used color and everything else we decided to leave it raw and blank. Uh, the reason for this is because um, one is you wouldn't have to spend on, you know, um, on painting. Uh, and then also uh, in, when it comes to the future life of the building, we can't just think about the cost as associated with the cost of construction. This is obviously a low budget project. So the cost of construction had to be low, but also this is a charity school. So the running cost also has to be low. So um, we decided that the, in order for the maintenance cost to be brought down, you would not have to repaint if you never painted it. <clears throat> so we had to do a lot of convincing and got the client to refrain from painting the, the common areas. And we just plastered them and left them as they were. Uh, also gives a very um, you know modernistic kind of aesthetic uh, to it. Um, and on the left side, you can see the facade. So you have this uh, lower entrance and that has kind of the same um, proportions to it as the rest of the courtyard houses. So it has this really human scale to it on the lower level, a smaller kind of footprint. And then when you go in, the space expands um, and becomes much bigger. And, uh, and the facade was um, clad with slate because the client wanted at least a little bit uh, you know, uh, something that looked a little better than just concrete. Uh, so um, the other reason we wanted to keep it really gray and nondescript was to uh, sort of stand out in contrast with the residential buildings of the neighborhood. There was an existing, as I said, existing courtyard house. This is how it looked before. Uh, and then while when it was demolished, and then this is the space that occupies uh, that courtyard house. So, uh, or just the, that occupies the space left uh, by the courtyard house. And we created these kind of light wells or uh, kind of cutouts um, in order to pay homage to the courtyard house and bring in uh, sunlight right into the heart of the building. So this is this, the, the bright red staircase sort of uh, becomes a spine of the building and connects all the levels in one in one sort of gesture. And on the right side, you can see the, the rock that comes into the building. So it, it's taken into the building and forms part of the building. That's the red staircase that, that goes through the building. We proposed a really green space. So not just preserving uh, the greenery outside, the trees outside, but we also wanted to bring in the outdoors into the, into the heart of the building. So not just in terms of the rock, but also uh, greenery. So some of this has been planted. And when, wherever you're standing, you're able to see the rock. So here um, in one of the classrooms, you you can see that one uh, wall of the classroom is completely uh, the, the sheet rock and completely untreated. Um, and also they, they use this classroom now uh, as, a, as an exhibition space for their science fair and not a classroom because everyone loves this um, space. Again, the court, the, sorry, the staircase that is uh, going up and you have, so you have two cutouts or two atriums that bring in light, sunlight into the building. So there was this uh, bridge that connects the, the part above the courtyard house, where, where the courtyard house used to be. And that's the, the, um, the staff room. So this is how it was under construction. So a lot of the design for this project had to be done on site. So we had to do a lot of redesigning. We had to take uh, a lot of design decisions on site while the construction was going on. So on the left, you can see, um, you know, on the, on the site, we've sketched it out and we've kind of uh, indicated. So a lot of the drawings were, you know, as built drawings were very different from the drawings that we proposed. And a lot of these drawings happen on site. Um, and on the right side is a reference image. Uh, this is called a chatta or a damdama from the old city of Hyderabad, where you have, you know, um, you, you could have two houses on either side of the street and you have this bridge connecting them. So this space kind of reminds us of that. You can see that every part of the building is lit naturally. Um, it's completely uh, naturally ventilated. And um, it, even though we, it, there is uh, electricity and they have lights, they never have to use them. They, they in fact, many of the spaces, um, they haven't even uh, put any light fixtures because it's never needed. The school functions only during the daytime and it's always brightly lit. And you can see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the class, the um, doors, windows, signage, grills, these are the uh, things which are brightly colored. So each of the classrooms, we've uh, color coded them and given them different colors um, within as well. So the, the teachers were a little concerned about gray uh, classrooms. So, uh, you know, they convinced us to 
sort of have the classrooms painted. So we used pastel uh, versions of the same colors within the classrooms to brighten them up. Uh, of course, they require maintenance now. So what's really interesting is that this, this, this school uh, was already occupied while it was getting constructed. So uh, the school was built incrementally over a period of four to five years, and it's still going on. There are some parts which are still not constructed. So it was a phase-wise construction. Um, and because these kids didn't have space, they started to occupy the school while it was being constructed. So they started to make, uh, it's really uh, fun to see that, you know, some of the spaces that were not designed to be uh, a particular, used in a particular way, they were used uh, in by the kids and the teachers themselves. This is the library. So the we almost lost the library because when we started to excavate, uh, we had um, a rock, uh, like the, the peak of the rock, which was at five feet height inside the space so that was that became a hindrance to you know create a workable space so um the the client wanted to kind of do away with the library but we came up with this idea that we'll have this step seating inside the library and it would be a very informal library and i think really that works because uh these are children who are not used to discipline and they're not used to the kind of structural school system they're very they're used to informal uh, sort of um informal sort of behaviors and informal learning uh, strategies. So uh, instead of the pin drop silence kind of library uh, where you have to be very, um, you know, uh, follow all the rules, they would just be able to uh, learn better if they had this informal space. Um, also being a charity project, we weren't able to be involved uh, at every, every step, you know, um, of the, of the whole process. So a lot of the design was done by, we had we just gave guidelines and then it was completed by the teachers, uh, sometimes also by the students. And this uh, slide actually shows the carpenter. So the carpenter came up with the, um, we just gave him the sizes um, or, you know, modular measurements of uh, what are the different kinds of colors and the different kinds of measurements or uh, units that he could use for the, for the library shelving. And then he designed the shelving system himself. And this is our. Uh, this was when I was not in town. Um, I think back in 2015 or 16, um, I was traveling, and then I had this conversation over WhatsApp with the carpenter, and then we had this back and forth um, understanding, and then uh, design discussions. And then this is from starting to completion. He he shared the entire project, and this is how he did it. I would give the credit uh, to the carpenter for um, you know for the design of the library or the or the shelving system. Um, and then different spaces get used in different ways. So as I said, the space was, this school was being used before it was con completely constructed. Um, here, there are three more classrooms that are coming up. So this, this is the first batch of students to graduate from this school. So uh, before the school was only till fifth standard. And then as these students grew, we added classrooms uh, sixth, seventh, eighth, so, so on and so forth until 10th. So we have 8th, 9th, and 10th that are coming up on this floor now. They're under construction. So the students uh, started to attend class regularly in their new school. Sometimes the goats are also attending. <coughs> and, uh, and yeah, before the roof was constructed, the students were occupying the space. So for a long time, there would be, until they raised funds to complete the upper part of the school and complete the skylight, the rain would come right inside the building and the children would play in the rain inside their school. It was really peculiar and unique. Uh, this is a perforated um, wall uh, towards the north side that brings in cool air and it uh, provides shade um, and, and makes the school kind of semi-open, lightweight um, concrete block walls, uh, blocks are used in the wall. Uh, so it provides shade and also the, the students sort of learn under this, uh, inside the shade. And I think some of the walls, if you look closely, you will be able to see there are scribbles in chalk and pen, uh, in pencil. Um, this is the only school probably where you're allowed to write on the walls because the walls haven't been painted. So children are allowed to write on the walls. Sometimes the teachers also write and teach on the walls. And this is after the skylight came up. This is a geometric skylight that we designed. Um, and then uh, in the triangular kind of structure incorporates a truss within it. And the length is 80 feet uh, long. The design of the skylight also uh, happened on site. That's our structural engineer who's 
uh, instructing the fabricator about how to, you know, how to make the skylight without actually releasing any structural, official structural drawings. Uh, he was able to just make it on site. Um, and then this model, uh, we provided this model uh, or a prototype for him to understand. And then he made, he just measured the model and then converted those measurements and made, made the skylight. And that's how it looks from above. We also designed the logo. The school is called Bright Horizon Academy. If you look it up on Google Maps, uh, go to Bright Horizon Academy, um, Golconda, and then you'll be able to actually see a walkthrough of the school uh, in 360 degree uh, images. So you'll be able to go through the school. The, the logo is also very much representative of the building and the terrain. So you have this horizon and you have uh, some part of it on the, on the um, above the ground and some part of it below the ground. So as I said earlier, the library almost, you know, got canceled. So one of the reasons that was given was that they didn't have the funds to, uh, to have books um, you know, provide books or, or purchase books. So what we did was we ran this campaign called Make Progress Possible uh, to um, invite people to get rid of their, you know, old um, children's books. So we raised about 250, um, you know, donations uh, of 250 children's books, used children's books from many different donors uh, across the city. Uh, and, and people were really happy to share the books that they loved to this library. Uh, for these children. Um, and we felt that the library was of utmost importance because these are kids who don't have, don't come from very educated backgrounds. So they may not have access to books at all at home. Um, and their their parents may not be very well read either. So in, they that I think reading, uh, inculcating the reading could only happen in inside the atmosphere of the school for them. So that was very important. To see a few before and after images, this is how it was when we first started, first visited the, the school in 2014. After most of it was constructed, 2017. This is the old schoolhouse, which, um, as I said, we allowed the teachers to kind of take their own decisions. The, the management also took their own decisions. So we provided certain guidelines for so this they took their own, like they took the color palette from the school that we designed and they applied it to this block and they designed that themselves. <clears throat> this is the view from the top back in uh, 2014 and then over the years while it was being constructed. And uh, remember I was talking about the, um, the perforated wall which provides shade. So they used to, they sit on, in the shade of the perforated wall and use the back of this other wall to, uh, they were learning, I think at the time they were learning uh, Telugu or something. So they had that, uh, I wish I had a picture of that. Uh, so that was written on the wall directly in chalk and they, they're they really used to learning outdoors. This was in 2017. So this uh, right side kind of becomes the, even though it's a raised level, that was where the um, retaining wall uh, was demolished and excavated and we got these two extra classrooms and the roof of that becomes the, um, becomes the uh, stage for assemblies and it also becomes the basketball court. And this is how it is today. This is, I took this during the lockdown. Um, they're still constructing uh, three more classrooms. They're almost done. This is how the school situates itself in the greater context of Golconda Fort. That's how it is. And the school has been visited by groups of students from all over India, many different colleges uh, from everywhere in India. And uh, every month we would have at least one group of students uh, or, you know, a tour visiting the school. Um, and also it's been featured on TV5. Uh, and during the lockdown, obviously, uh, all that stopped. But instead, uh, we joined the Design Virtual Design Festival. We were the only Indian firm to be representing, you know, India in that festival, uh, the very first virtual design festival. So in that, um, I took, a, um, took them on a tour of the school uh, while walking through it with a camera on my head. So you, you will be able to see this if you go to the YouTube uh, channel or you can go to our website, designerware.org. You can see a video of the walkthrough uh, throughout the entire school and get an idea of it. Uh, it's been widely published in Hyderabad Design Diaries, uh, among many other publications, um, Art Daily, Design, etc. Uh, and also uh, we're really proud that 
It was awarded the silver award by the green, uh, as a green building by the Indian Green Building uh, Council in 2018. And this year we are hoping to renew it and probably upgrade this because we um, have added many different, because I'm, I'm um, from an architecture point of view, obviously uh, as an architect, our job is done. But uh, I always say we when we refer to the school because we're always kind of really closely involved with the school itself. Uh, so what they're doing now is that they've come up with many more green initiatives. And so that will give them more points as a green building and maybe take it from silver to gold, hopefully. Uh, the school has, has won many different awards over the years. Um, and also I was named Emerging Architect of the Year um, by NDTV Design and Architecture Awards in 2016. Uh, primarily because of this project. Uh, you can also see my TEDx talk on YouTube. And um, the, the most interesting part of this year was that um, we were long listed for the Design Awards, the 2020 Design Awards, um, as, a, as an architecture, emerging architecture studio. Thank you. Awesome presentation, uh, that we I think took us on a, on a very interesting journey of uh, quite a plethora of your projects and uh, quite intriguing to look at how you um, intertwine uh, both um, um, data in terms of uh, statistics and then put that into an architectural language. I really enjoyed uh, that journey. Just so a little um, plug in, I just like to tell people to follow our, uh, you know, you can see our work on designaware.org. Uh, also on Instagram, I think that's where everybody is now more accessible. So designaware, um, as well as Fractal's workshop on Instagram or or my personal Instagram, the Fatima. So you can follow us for more experiments. Great, great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, for taking your time and being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you.